got a lot of international news to tell you about today on CNN 10. Thank you for coming along with us. I'm Carl Azus at the CNN Center. First report takes us to the Middle East, where the fight is getting more intense in one of the last parts of Syria that's controlled by rebels who are fighting the government. Eastern Ghouta is a suburb of Damascus, the Syrian capital. Almost 400,000 people live there, and Eastern Ghouta has been completely surrounded by Syrian government forces for more than four years. It's supposed to be what's called a de-escalation zone, meaning an area where civilians can live without being targeted by anyone fighting in Syria's civil war. But observers in the region say that shelling and a series of airstrikes by the Syrian government have killed at least 250 civilians in the past 48 hours and turned parts of eastern Ghouta to rubble. A hospital director there says the airstrikes are nothing new, that they've been going on for years, but that residents have never seen anything like the violence of recent days. So why was eastern Ghouta targeted? The Syrian government says rockets and mortars were launched from there on Tuesday and that they killed five civilians and injured 20 others. Government media say the Syrian army responded with, quote, precise strikes that targeted rocket launchers and defensive positions of the armed rebels there. The ISIS terrorist group has also played a part in Syria's civil war, but it's lost a lot of ground in the country over the past year. And Syrian government forces, supported by Russia, are making a major effort to take over the remaining areas that are held by rebels. The civilians who live in eastern Ghouta say they expect the government will launch an offensive on the ground in the days ahead. The conflict in Syria has been going on since 2011. The United Nations estimates that 400,000 people have been killed and millions more have had to leave their homes or get out of the country altogether. Next, we're traveling to the South American nation of Venezuela, which is trying something new to help save its failing economy. Venezuela used to be the wealthiest country in Latin America, but its government has become increasingly authoritarian in recent years, taking over businesses, limiting people's freedoms, and increasing its controls over the nation's economy. And now, that economy is in shambles. Anuncio el aumento del 40% del salario mínimo nacional y de todas las tablas salariales a nivel nacional de maestro. And now with its currency almost completely worthless, Venezuela's government is turning to a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin to try to bring in revenue. It's called the Petro. It's the first government cryptocurrency in the world. It's hoped to bring in more than $2 billion for Venezuela. And it's supposed to be supported by Venezuela's reserves of crude oil and precious metals like gold. Some investors say the idea is innovative and that it might attract investment from the Middle East, Europe, and Asia. But many economists say the Petro is not going to solve Venezuela's problems of food shortages, decreasing oil production, and people leaving the country. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro says an economic war against his country that's been waged by the U.S. and other nations is responsible for Venezuela's problems. U.S. President Donald Trump says the Venezuelan government is a dictatorship, and America is one of several countries that wants Venezuelan President Maduro to either leave or democratically reform his government. 10-second trivia. Which of these events was not part of the first Winter Olympics, which were held in 1924? Curling, ice hockey, military patrol, or luge? In the events that became known as the first Winter Olympics, luge was not an event. It didn't become part of the games until 1964. In addition to the athletes, the events, and the weather, a lot of attention on this year's games has centered on North and South Korea. 
there appears to have been a significant improvement in relations between the two rivals. Some international analysts are skeptical. They think this is the calm before the storm, that trouble may be ahead with regard to North Korea after the Olympics are over. Others think the positivity is a sign of good things to come. What does a flag mean to you? For some, it's pride, for others, symbolism. For Korean athletes at the 2018 Winter Olympics, it means bringing together two countries still technically at war. Until the end of the 2017, the relationship between the two Korea was very, very cold. Almost the, the war is imminent at the time, as usual circumstances. But this uh, conflict in atmosphere certainly changes because of the Olympic Games. Dr. Jung Woo Lee is a Korean academic currently researching the Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang. It is quite difficult to say whether this mood of the dialogue maintain after the, the Olympic Games, but at least it is a very, very good sign in, in for the two Korea, and they also agreed to have another conversation to ease uh, military tension over the Korean Peninsula. Some hope that this could be like the ping-pong democracy that helped thaw the Cold War relations between China and the USA in the early 70s. How do you think this compares to ping-pong diplomacy between the US and China? Um, there is something quite similar here. Ping-pong diplomacy in the early 1970s was meant to initiate something. Here, the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics are also used as um, a kind of spark to initiate something else. But then there are also a lot of other issues where, I mean, we don't find any commonalities. There hadn't been a, a war in the same way as the Korean War still overshadows relations between North and South Korea and America and, and so on. So yes, there is a degree of similarity, but they're quite different. See, this isn't the first time North and South Korea have marched together. Yeah! In 1991, at the World Table Tennis Championships in Japan, the two countries competed as one for the first time. Since then, the two walked out together no fewer than seven times at different world events. South Korean speed skater Bo Ra Lee participated in the 2006 Winter Olympics in Turin under the unified flag. She spoke to CNN about what it was like. But while emotions were high for athletes, neither the flag nor the games have done much to progress peace talks in the past. This has happened before, but it hasn't really yeah, brought about well, much material change. So, you know, what's to say that this time's any different? Well, it has happened before, but the context was slightly different. Uh, it happened before to really communicate foreign policy that usually happens behind closed doors to the people. For the last 10 years, um, there hasn't really been any kind of serious politics happening between North and South Korea. And for the last two years, they haven't even talked to each other. The purpose is totally different. It's much more about perhaps rekindling this kind of flame of diplomacy. For many sports fans around the world, the games are not about politics. For many living in North and South Korea, sports and politics go hand in hand. A set of dentures belonging to first U.S. President George Washington is preserved at his historic home. But a lock of his hair might have recently fallen out of history. New York's Union College was recently reviewing its inventory, and the hair fell out of an almanac dating back to 1793. Historians believe that Washington gave the book to Alexander Hamilton's family, who were friends of his, and locks of hair were commonly given as gifts back then. It was a way to show you really keratin, that you feel it meant to do something special even if that meant tearing your hair out. Some historians may bristle about the assumption they may have a strand of doubt and demand a DNA test to get a lock on the facts so that no one's sideburned. But either way, it's where today's show split ends. We hope you like our style on CNN 10.